Okay, that's a little bit of the background as we come to this new chapter that we're considering. There are three great things that happen in Acts chapter 5. And the first thing is a very, very hard thing. It's a very shocking thing. It's one of the most famous things that happens in the book of Acts. It's one of the most um, well-known things which happens, and it's also one of the hardest to understand. And to be honest, it's one of the hardest to explain or to accept. And I, I don't know if all of you are believers, but I will say this. Um, this is not a passage of Scripture that I would ever introduce to an unbeliever. Um, it's a hard place. It's kind of like starting in graduate school instead of starting in kindergarten. It's a very, very tough thing even for believers to choke down. It's almost an impossible thing for an unbeliever to understand or to accept. And it has to do with these two famous early Christians in the Jerusalem church called Ananias and Sapphira. And there's a contrast. At the end of chapter 4, Barnabas sells his property and brings all the money to the church. At the beginning of chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they sold their property and they brought some of the money to the church, but they kept some secretly for themselves. Please understand this. Their sin was not that they kept part of the money for themselves. That wasn't the sin. The sin was that they told everybody that they gave everything. They could have kept all the money for themselves and it would not have been a sin, at least not a sin that would have brought a judgment like this. The sin was that they pretended to give everything, but they didn't. There was an Israeli prime minister called Yitzhak Rabin. He was shot in the back by a fanatic and killed uh, in the late or in the mid-1990s. A few years later, a few years earlier, he had to resign and step down from being prime minister. Later he became back. Later he came back. But the reason he had to resign is because there was a law that no Israeli could maintain a bank account in a foreign bank. I don't know if they still have that law, but they used to have that law. Well, when Yitzhak Rabin's wife visited Washington, she went to a bank. And a journalist who worked for an Israeli newspaper was tracking her movements every minute of the day and noticed that she went to that bank. And he did a little digging. And he discovered that Yitzhak Rabin and his wife had a bank account in that bank in Washington, D.C. They put it in the newspaper. It became public. The prime minister had to resign. He had to leave office. He was breaking the law. He had secret money that he, that he was hiding, that he wasn't telling anybody about. Now, in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, let me just say that uh, <clears throat> I don't know how Peter knew, except that the Holy Spirit made sure that he knew. I don't know why this sin was picked out. Let's talk, let, let me read what happens. You know what happens, and then we'll talk about what happens. Peter says in verse 3, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, it was yours, and after it was sold, it was yours. Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. He fell down dead, and a great fear came upon the people. 
Now, uh, three hours later, his wife came in and she didn't know that her husband was dead. Peter said, did you sell this piece of property at this particular price? She said, yes, that was the price. And you see, that was a lie. That wasn't the price. She sold it at a greater price. Peter said, why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they shall carry you out as well. And verse 10 says she fell down dead. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. First of all, we can be angry at God about this if we want to, but we can only be angry if we don't understand certain things. Here's the first thing we have to understand. Where did Ananias and Sapphira get their life? Where did they get their breath? Where does life come from? It was given to them by the Lord. Did God owe them life? Was He in debt to them so that He had to pay them their breath and their life? No. He gave them that life as a gift. God invented life. Life is God's concept. Life is God's creation. You and I don't own anything that God doesn't give us. We don't own our breath. We can only get breath this much at a time. That's ours. But that's all we can get. And then we have to get it again. And we get, who do we get it from? We get it from the Lord. And one day, the last thing we do is not going to be this. The last thing we do is going to be this. And then it's going to be over. And it will happen to each of us one day, whether we are, uh, unless we're alive when the Lord comes. So first of all, God owned their life. Secondly, God gave them their life. Thirdly, God sustained their life. Now, we see many things happening, for instance, with the children of Israel in the desert, in the book of Exodus, in the book of Numbers, in Deuteronomy, and in, in Leviticus. God is manifesting His presence. God is showing Himself in the sky. God is showing Himself in, in the cloud. God is showing Himself in the fiery pillar. God is showing Himself every day when He rains down bread upon the camp. If you sin in a situation like that, it's almost like sinning in heaven. It's almost like sinning in the presence of God. What can you say about somebody who sins in the presence of God? And so in those situations, sometimes people were immediately executed when they sinned. At this moment, in the church in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit was filling the place. Miracles were being worked. People were being healed. And these people were lying to God. They were publicly lying to God, and God took their life. Let me just say one more thing. I can't prove this, but I believe with all my heart that Ananias and Sapphira are in heaven. I believe they were Christians. And I believe that's one reason why they were judged, because they were Christian. You know, 100% of every generation dies. 100%. If we're going to blame God for death, we could blame Him for all deaths. Why not? Why did we single out the death of Ananias and Sapphira? There are many, many innocent people, much more innocent than Ananias and Sapphira, who die with greater pain and difficulty and more slowly than Ananias and Sapphira. Why does this upset us so much? There's another thing that I think it proves when we look at a passage like this and we're troubled. It's so easy for us to judge God. It's so easy for us to stand in judgment over God's judgment. And we're tempted to say, that's not right. God should not have done that. God, who is omniscient, God who knows everything, he knows every reality. He knows every contingency. He knows every possibility. He knows the thoughts and inclinations of every heart. And yet we are tempted to stand in judgment over God and say, why did you do this hard thing to Ananias and Sapphira? So 
we have no trouble judging God, but we don't want God to judge someone else. We sinners don't have any trouble judging a holy God, but we have a problem with a holy God judging sinful creatures. Why? It's because we are sinners. And it's because we're rebels by nature, and we need to understand that. Now, obviously, I can't prove that Ananias and Sapphira are in heaven, but I think they are. 1 John 5 talks about something called a sin unto death. I think probably they sinned a sin unto death, and they were immediately judged. Um, more than one scholar, uh, a scholar who wrote in Latin, a German of the 18th century called Bingle, a Scottish scholar who died in 1990 called F.F. F. Bruce, have pointed out that the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5 has many similarities to the story of Achan in Joshua chapter 7. In Joshua chapter 6, Jericho is conquered, and there's treasure that comes out of the conquests of Jericho. But the treasure was not for the soldiers. The treasure was for the tabernacle and for the Lord's house and for the national treasury and the worship of the Lord. But one of the soldiers, a, a man of the tribe of Judah named Achan, secretly kept some gold and some costly raiment, some cl expensive clothes from the sack of Jericho, the conquest of Jericho, and he hid it. He hid it in his tent. And in Joshua chapter 7, the children of Israel uh, fight with a city called uh, Ai, A -I, spelled Ai, and they, they're defeated. They suffer a great defeat. And the reason they're defeated is because Achan is hiding the contraband, hiding the, um, the gold and the raiment that he's not supposed to have in his tent. And once he's discovered, he's executed, and his family are executed. And it's a hard, hard thing to think about. And the exact same thing happens in the church in Jerusalem with Ananias and Sapphira. Now, remember, the sin is not keeping something for themselves. The sin is pretending to give everything to the Lord when they didn't. You know, it's a sin against uh, conscience. They were lying. They knew they were lying, but they sinned anyway. They sinned against their own conscience. It was a sin against the people because they pretended to, to share, to, to give what they had to the people, but they didn't. But it was a sin against God. They knew God was present in the place. They knew God would, would hear their lie. They were testing God. It was actually a, a, a test to prove whether God was really there or not, or whether He was going to do anything. And He was there, and He did do something. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. You ever ask yourself the question, well, why, why doesn't God just deal with these bad people, whoever the bad people are? Maybe you think Osama bin Laden is a bad person, or maybe you think George Bush was a bad person. You know, whoever the bad people are, no matter what your politics are, why doesn't God just take these people away? Well, if He did, what about us? What about our sin? If God killed all sinners, He'd have to kill us, wouldn't He? Because we're sinners too. Um, you know, what, what can we learn from a terrifying passage like this in the Bible? Does it have any application for us? I mean, I think we're all pretty, pretty happy that God is no longer in the business of striking hypocrites dead at church. Probably our attendance wouldn't be that high. Probably I wouldn't get to go to church next Sunday if, if God struck all hypocrites dead at church. 
But I think there's one, 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 one really big, big, big lesson we have to take away from this. Something very, very practical. And I think it's this. Be sure, as far as it's, as it's in your power, be sure that no one has a higher opinion of who you are as a Christian than the true reality. Make sure that you never leave an impression that you're a more faithful Christian than you really are. If other people are going to make a mistake, let them underestimate you. Don't let them overestimate you. Make it your business that no one ever overestimates your commitment to the Lord. You praise God and you praise the commitment of others, but you be hard on yourself. You be modest about yourself and what you've done for the Lord. And by the way, let me tell you something. People aren't really interested in what you've done for the Lord. People are interested in what the Lord's done for you. That's really what unbelievers are interested in. They don't really care that much about what you've done for the Lord, but they're kind of impressed by what the Lord has done for you. And that's what we need to talk about. That's what we need to celebrate. We need to celebrate what God has done for us, what God has given up for us at the cross, not what we've given up to God. This is what Ananias and Sapphira were celebrating. They were pretending to have given everything to the Lord. When they didn't, they held something back, and they were struck dead. Do I know 100% for certain that we will see them in heaven? No, but I believe we will see them in heaven. There are many, many people in the Bible that we're really not sure whether they make it or not. People like Lot, people like Saul, people like Esau, people like Ishmael, and people like Ananias and Sapphira. Are they in heaven? Maybe so, maybe not. I think these two are in heaven. also think Lot's in heaven. I don't know about Saul. Um, it's not for us to decide, is it? So this is the first great thing that happens in Acts chapter 5. The church is being tested from within. In chapter 4 and chapter 3, the church is tested from without. The chief priests and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, are persecuting the church and threatening them and putting pressure on them. In chapter 5, we see a great challenge from within. Um, I hope you will always love the Lord. I hope you will always worship the Lord. I hope you'll always serve the Lord. Most of you are quite young. If you follow the Lord and if you worship the Lord, 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, and some of you are young enough to worship the Lord for 50 more years, you will discover that there were some people apparently worshiping the Lord with you whose commitment was not real, who were pretending. Some of them are not believers at all. Some of them are believers, but they're not always telling the truth. They're being hypocritical like Ananias and Sapphira. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150 or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, 
Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300, or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.